رحبوا معنا بهاشم الغيلي Welcome everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, as instructed, I have prepared two talks. One is about my personal story and the challenges that I went through. And the other is about genetic memory. And the choice is yours because there is a limit when it comes to time. So what should we talk about? D genetic memory. So we start with the genetic memory. And if there is time, we can talk about the second one. Uh, so many memories are created every day. These memories are part of our personal experiences. But did you know that your brain is capable of creating false memories? And these false memories become so vivid that you start believing them and you start bringing them into discussions that Oh, something happened to me, but it actually didn't happen. And that is called a false memory. And your brain, no matter how sophisticated it is, it has this fault of creating false memories. Now, if you look into the human body, there are three places where memories form. You have got muscle memory. Some people learn a piano. And after some time, you notice that they remember where to put their fingers at. Why? Well, first of all, their brain formed new neurons, new connections. Second, the muscles now remember where to put the fingers. So when you play an instrument, your muscles also contribute. They have their own memory. The brain also is, of course, the champion of all of them. The cerebral cortex is the region in the brain where there is the memory center. The most important and emotional memories, they are stored in that region. And the most amazing fact that you are going to learn today is that memories are also stored in your genome. Did you know that memories can actually be transferred from ancestors to offspring? So some memories that you have might not actually be yours. They have come from one of your parents or grandparents. Someone in your family history has learned something. And this memory was transferred into you. And these memories can come in different forms and shapes. The skills. Some people are so good at learning how to play a musical instrument without so much training. Why? Because one of their members of the family history has learned it, it became imprinted into their genome, and now it's transferred across generations. And there was a recent study on animal models that showed that these memories can be transferred across 14 generations, and that's actually a lot. So remember, when you learn a new skill, the chances are that it might be transferred into one of your future generations. So make sure that you learn some good skills. Now, how many of you are afraid of spiders? Please raise your hand. That's a lot of people. And how many are afraid of heights? Also. How many are afraid of both? Yeah, very few. Now, it turned out, according to neuroscientists, that phobias might also be inherited memories. One of your ancestors was exposed to a spider and developed the fear of spider because of a bad experience and that experience was imprinted into the genome and now it's being transferred across generations. So you are born afraid of something you haven't encountered in your life because someone else had. The other thing that genetic memories are important for is survival. Now, why would you be afraid of spiders? Because whoever was afraid of spiders before you now knows to avoid spiders. Maybe they are venomous spiders and you want to avoid their bites. So it's a survival instinct now. It's becoming a survival instinct to help you avoid getting into bad situations once again. One of the amazing things about genetic memory is that sometimes traumatic experiences 
somebody who was exposed to sexual abuse in the childhood, this would leave a huge emotional memory which could be imprinted into the genome and it could now be transferred across generations. And that's, of course, bad. Now, this is a very crazy experiment conducted by one of the scientists in the 19... 70s. In the 1970s, experiments on animal models were not so strict. So he did this experiment. First, he trained mice to navigate around a maze. Okay? And he tortured them. And then he took these mice that he trained and decapitated them, of course. Cut the heads. And then he took their brains and the livers created a homogenate. Homogenate means you have water and now you have a mixture with brain particles and liver particles. And he took these homogenates and injected them into mice that have not been trained to navigate around the maze. So what happened? The memory was transferred. By injecting the untrained mice with the homogenate of the brain and also of the liver, they acquired the memory without being trained. And they concluded that this is a form of a memory that was non-genetic and it was rather transferred through stress. So stress could also create a memory that can be transferred. Amazing experiment. If, all, if that wasn't crazy enough, take a look at this recent experiment with flatworm. What they did here is that they trained flatworms to navigate around the maze and then get the prize, which is a piece of beef liver. And then they decapitated them. That's where their neurons responsible for memory are formed. What happened next? They grew their heads back and still remembered how to go and get the food. Amazing, huh? Now, some scientists say, no, well, this is probably not a memory that was stored in the neurons or in the genes. Maybe it was a muscle memory. Maybe these flatworms learned how to navigate around the maze and they built a muscle memory around that. So by the time they grew their heads, they can still reach to the foot. This is another amazing experiment. It's the transfer of memory. Memories can also be transferred from one member of the same species into another member. There are two snails here. The first one was trained to navigate around the maze and then it received an electric shock. And then the scientist found out which neurons was turn were turning on when this memory formed. So they took these neurons, they transferred them into the second snail. And that memory of the electric shock was transferred to the second snail, even though that snail was not exposed to the electric shock. And how did they determine that? They determined that by exposing it to electric shock, they found the same reaction, the same response to the electric shock. So memories can be transferred across generations. They can be transferred manually in the lab they can be growing back, as you have seen with the flatworms, but they can also be manipulated. Here, what scientists do, basically, is that they try to find out which memory, which neurons are responsible for a certain memory. Because if you look into the human brain, these neurons turn on. They flash light. Okay? And they determine which ones are they. Then they genetically engineer them to respond to laser or light. So when you flash light into these neurons that are genetically engineered, they turn on, which means they can turn on a memory now. Yeah? And so what they do is that they take first mice, they train them to remember something, and they find out which neurons are responsible for this, and then they transfer these neurons after, you know, they genetically engineer them. And now when you now they transfer them into mice that have not been exposed to the same memory. And so when you now flash light into these neurons, the mouse will start remembering something that it hasn't experienced. So that's amazing. So what can we do 
with such stuff? What can we learn from these experiments? We can learn that this has a lot of applications. Now, if you look into people who have depression, most of the time they have negative thoughts in their mind. Now, imagine if we can enhance their positive thoughts. Now, they will have memories that did not happen to them, but it's probably less evil than committing suicides. So this is one of the future applications of memory manipulation. The second one is simulated memories. Would you rather pay for a vacation, maybe uh, 2,000 uh, dinar, I guess, now that I know that dinar costs more than euros. So would you pay 2,000 to actually go for a vacation, experience it yourself, or maybe 50 dinar to get that memory implanted into your head and just remember it as if it actually happened. <laughs> it's a crazy future, right? But it could happen. With these experiments, we are really heading into such future. Behavioral implants. Uh, if you notice, prisoners spend a lot of time in prison, which cost the government a lot of money. Yeah? Now, what if we can induce behavioral changes in their brain by manipulating their minds? Another interesting application for memory manipulation. And finally, memory restoration. There are many lost memories in your childhood that you don't remember, or some lost memories because of traumatic experiences that are now taking over, because when you don't call the old memories, new ones take over, you lose the old ones, basically. Also, when you remember a certain memory, you don't remember the original one, you remember the last time you remembered it. So after some time, this memory gets distorted, and it goes to the trash, it's lost. But with such experiment, we're heading towards a future where we could keep our distant memories intact in the brain. And these are some of the remarkable applications of memory manipulation, which I wanted to introduce you to. Thank you. I, I don't know if we still have time for, yes. Okay, so I guess we still have time. All right, so I, I will tell you about my story with science communication and how we came to do this stuff. Uh, we start with the second presentation. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> okay, so this is where I was born. That's Yemen, yeah? That's the village. Um, it's surrounded by farms. Basically, my father wanted me to either become a farmer, basically, well, actually, become a farmer, that's it. But I myself wanted to do something else, yeah? I was interested in education and learning, and I was interested in reading. This is something that we have all acknowledged, we have all to acknowledge. Sometimes your parents will force you, hey, either a doctor or engineer, and you have to choose. Say, no, I don't want. I have to follow my passion because that's my future and that's what I'm going to be. And that's what you really have to do. So I challenged the society and decided to go for what I really want, to follow my path in education. Uh, so I got a scholarship and I went to Pakistan to study. I got my bachelor's in biotechnology, which is just what I wanted because I'm passionate about science. As I was about to graduate from Pakistan, I applied for a scholarship to Germany. And I went back to Yemen and I worked in this lab. It's a quality control laboratory. I worked there for six months, waiting for the response from the German scholarship. And then I received that response from the German scholarship. They said, all right, you have been accepted uh, out of 1,050 people. And they only choose five. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But there is a big challenge. There is a big challenge. The guys at this job, they told me, why don't you stay for two more months? We turn your contract into permanent. Then you can travel to Germany and still get money. 
But the Germans said, no, you have to come now. So I had to quit this job. So I quit this job. I went to Germany. But I didn't have a university admission. That's a problem. The scholarship guys said, you have four months. During these four months, you're going to study German language, and you have to secure an admission. If you don't secure an admission, you're going to lose your scholarship, and you're not going to be able to apply again. So that's a problem. Unfortunately, by the time I was in Germany, all the universities already closed. <laughs> the admission. So that's a big problem. I can't go back and request my old job and I have to face this big hurdle. I sent over 100 applications, even though after the deadline was already closed, you know, to emails and uh, they just didn't really bother. Most of them rejected it and the rest didn't even respond. One day, as I was like four weeks away from losing my scholarship, I sent 70 emails to people and I told them, would you please make a, an exception? Just take a look at my document. And they just said no, except one professor, Professor Sebastian Springer. This guy believed in me. He said, sure, let me look into your documents. He looked into my documents and he saw an opportunity he scheduled an interview, which I passed. The scholarship was saved. I got accepted, finally. <laughs> but there was a problem, because in Pakistan, I was learning only theoretical. Now, in Germany, it's very complicated. It's a far more advanced educational system. It's all practical. They expect you to come ready, prepared. You know what you're doing. You know what you, yeah? So it was a very big transition. And it was full of complications. And I went to this professor again and I told him, do you think that you have made the right choice by accepting me here? He said, well, the fact that you are here tells me that you want to change the situation. So don't worry. I will support you and I'm here for you. And that's, that's what I love about you know, Germany is that they really support their students. And I encourage all professors to always support their students. So. I managed to go through and catch up to the level of the other students, studying triple the times of what other students did. That's the university where I studied, and then I gave the graduation speech. I graduated in 2015. I started my PhD, and then I quit after three months. Why? <laughs> Because I realize that what I want to do is educate people, communicate science. Sometimes you have to know. You say, hey, I am good at this, but I'm also good at this. Which one I am better at? Which one I can serve the society more with? And then you go for the one that you want. Yeah, the one that you can serve the society with. And I went for science communication. I joined Futurism, a media company in New York. We worked together. I learned a lot of skills while I was working with them. But then after some time, I notice that I'm not learning anything new anymore. I get my salary, I get my money, but I'm not learning anything. I am young, I, am, I have energy, and I'm capable of doing more. So I say goodbye. You have to know when you do it, yeah? It's easy, to, it's easy for, success to disguise, for failure to disguise itself as a success, yeah? If you are still young and your job is no longer contributing more to your growth, then you have to go. So I, I continued my work on science communication. Now the page has 28.5 million followers across the globe, 9 billion views, and it just keeps skyrocketing in numbers. It's now number four globally. And if you look, Bayern Munich is actually just one step ahead, actually, two steps ahead. So soon I'll also catch up with them. I am now giving uh, talks internationally, TED Talks, and you know, communicating science beyond just online media. I'm also going out there and communicating science to the general public in different platforms. And I went back to the professor to thank him for success. I gave him a grant of 50,000 euros for his research. <laughs> we, 
we have to always pay back to the people who contributed to our success, whether it's a platform, whether it's a country, whether it's a person, we have to do that. It's an obligation, if you're a good person. <laughs> I now want to branch out to more than just science communication, so I started making science fiction movies. This is my first movie. And it's, uh, I don't know if we can play the video, it's one minute long, but we have limited time. Can we? I think we can play the video then, behind the scene, when we are filming the movie. Mm, it doesn't look like it's going to play because we transferred the... Okay, but what I want to say is that I'm branching out beyond science communication, making science fiction movies. This is the first poster of the movie, which is supposed to be ready within five months or less. I also want to start writing science communication books. So this is my next goal. And the biggest goal of my life is this. Hashim al Gaili's Foundation for Education and Innovation. <laughs> now, this foundation is going to do three things. First of all, it has it will support students who have been in the, who are still in the same situation that I was in. Yeah, I have experienced this myself. It's frustrating, and I want to make a change. So the scholarships that will be provided by this foundation will go to the people who are talented and they are really ready to make change. The second thing that it will do is it will find new ways to use technology to improve education. We have been using the same stuff, textbooks, same style, it's been like that for a long time. So the foundation is going to bring new technologies, use them in education so that we can make a change. And finally, this foundation is going to bring together decision makers, policy makers, and scientists so we can make rational decisions. Climate change, for example, it's a big problem. Most of our fate lies within the hands of policymakers. Now we have to make them aware, we have to give them the science. And this foundation will increase their awareness on different topics that concern our planet. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>